one of the main reasons that we're here together uh, tonight is to celebrate a tradition uh, of recognizing CED alumni for outstanding achievements in their professions uh, and, and their careers. Since 1998, over 70 uh, alumni have received College of Environmental Design uh, Distinguished Alumni Awards. And it's my pleasure to add three members to this very illustrious group. So I'd like to invite Kofi Bonner to come forward, please. That's the hot seat. Kofi serves as, as a president of Lennar Urban, where he oversees all land acquisition and urban development activities in Northern California. Um, Kofi began as a, after he got both his master's in city planning and his master's in architecture at CED. Uh, he began as a, an affordable housing developer, uh, developer for Oakland Community Housing, and then in 1989, went on to serve as head of redevelopment in Emeryville, leading that city's incredible transformation. He later became Deputy Executive Director of the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency and Director of Community and Economic Development for the City of Oakland and, and also Interim City Manager. He was tapped by Willie Brown to uh, serve uh, as his Chief Economic Policy Advisor in charge of leading major redevelopment projects in the city. From 1998 to 2004, Kofi led urban development in a very different way. He went uh, to lead the Cleveland Browns as their C e CAO. And he was responsible not only for business affairs, but not surprisingly, the construction of their new stadium. Uh, later, he became regional director and executive vice president of, of MBNA before joining Lennar. Kofi is deeply engaged in community and professional service in many, many ways, not only here in the Bay Area, but nationally and internationally. Um, and one of the things that I want to note is he's, he's a member of the National Planning and Technical Advisory Council to the Ghanaian government, which is his native country. Uh, among Kofi's most uh, recent projects are the development of Treasure Island, whose plan uh, received a Clinton uh, Global Initiative uh, Sustainable Development Award, and the Hunters Point Shipyard Candlestick Park uh, Revitalization Project, which will remake a very major portion of San Francisco. So, Kofi, you get a medal. All right. Thank you, thank you very much, Jennifer. You're doing a fabulous job, I might say. <laughs> fabulous. And uh, certainly thank you to whomever it was that thought it wise to give me something like this. I think this is wonderful. <clears throat> I would first and foremost like to uh, thank uh, some folks who are very, very dear to me. Uh, my wife is here, Gladys, and uh, it's, it's amazing because we, as, we, uh, as we were entering this stadium, you know, we were candidly thinking of the years we spent when, when I was a student here in Berkeley. I mean, we both came with two suitcases, and now here we are. Uh, but um, I'm fortunate enough to have my, my two daughters here. My son uh, couldn't make it, but certainly Noel and Afia, thank you so much for joining me this evening. <clears throat> Michelle, thank you for coming this evening. And, uh, you know, it's great to share an evening like this with uh, your, real, your family, your close friends. And I would like to sort of shout out, as they say, to a very, very dear friend of the family, Mr. Stephen Kay, who I've known for about 20 years. And, <laughs> and in many ways has, uh, has uh, shared my journey with me in, in some respect. It's partly the reason I ended up in Cleveland, actually. Uh, but uh, I, I will say that it's, uh, it's, it's really uh, interesting as you, as you think back to see, well, how does one get to this point? And um, there's no question but for the care and the extra care taken by some of the folks who were faculty, uh, I, I wouldn't be here. It's just a guy who came as a foreign student who landed on the steps <clears throat> of Berkeley. It took a few professors to just take a little more time, and I'm fortunate enough to say that uh, folks like uh, Jesse Rychek, uh, folks like Professor Ross Ellis, uh, certainly I'm very, very happy to see that Mike Teets is here and Mary Camario is here, because... <clears throat> 
because you know when you are when you are a, 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 a sort of a foreign student, you're, you're looking for ways to sort of fit in and, and certainly excel, and it certainly takes a little more attention from the faculty uh, to to make the these young men and women feel comfortable, so that they can indeed uh, uh, just jump in and, and, and do what they are, frankly, I think, uh, natively uh, endowed to do in some respects. So I want to thank you, Michael, and certainly thank uh, Mary, because certainly without your, as I say, special attention and care, Lord knows where I'd have been. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, everybody. A lot <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Great. Daniel Iacafano, please come forward. Trained in urban planning and environmental psychology, uh, Dan Iacafano received his doctorate in, environ in environmental planning from the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning in 1986. Um, along with Susan Goltzman, his partner, um, he founded MIG, MIG, a widely renowned uh, firm focusing on regional and land use planning, facilitation, partnering, and organizational development. Since 1982, um, uh, MIG has focused on planning, designing, and sustaining environments that support human development, and um, they've assisted public agencies throughout the country uh, in projects that enhance community livability, support revitalization, and connect people with places. Now, Dan combines his strategic and organizational planning expertise with interactive facilitation techniques, and in doing so, has, has helped countless agencies, organizations, and companies in working together to articulate their goals, strategies, and actions for the future. Uh, his projects are really wide-ranging. They, they go for all the way from regional growth and economic development to public transit and traffic to housing and environmental impacts, and he's helped uh, community organizations, environmental groups, business leaders, and public agencies create land use plans that have been successfully implemented. Um, lecturing and teaching at several institutions, including CED, uh, Dan is the author of several books. Um, public Involvement as an Organizational Development Process, Meeting of the Minds, The Inclusive City, and most recently, What is Your Construction Management uh, IQ? <laughs> What, EQ, EQ, EQ. I, just, I guess I just read that from my own personal perspective as IQ and knew, knew that mine is really low. Um, but after working on Worcester Hall for a while, it's going up really fast. Um, okay, Dan's work has received a lot of acclaim from the National League of Cities, the International Downtown Association, the American Planning Association, and the American Society of Landscape Architects. So please join me in congratulating Dan. Thank you all very much. Uh, coming to Berkeley, I knew was the right place for me. And I want to thank all my professors, teachers, mentors, colleagues, friends who have helped me over the years to, uh, to be here this evening. Our practice, MIG, is uh, based on the, the concept of inclusive design. And we've tried to set a high bar, uh, not just looking at sound technical planning and design, but also to look at uh, equity in planning and design, which we think is a higher bar, but not always easy to achieve and something we strive for. And uh, we, we look to the future in creating uh, environments that are, that are truly inclusive. I want to thank my partner, Susan Goldsman, who many of you know uh, is a key uh, member of the firm and uh, a partner in all aspects of my, my life. And so I, I want to recognize Susan and, and give her my thanks. I recently heard uh, research about the value of two, duo. And uh, I know without Susan, I would not be here. We've really seen all of this develop together. Uh, so 
thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. So our third distinguished alum, uh, alumna is Allison Williams, who received her Master's of Architecture degree at CED. Uh, Allison is the design director for AECOM San Francisco Metro uh, Architecture Practice and leads the San Francisco Design Studio. Allison is known for her collaborative drive and her interdisciplinary design leadership, which generate inventive, sustainable, and relevant buildings and places. She has a very broad portfolio, amazingly broad. It includes civic buildings, corporate offices, educational facilities, research labs, and cultural facilities, as well as mixed use and high density urban development. She's an intuitive and creative uh, thinker, um, works with large teams uh, expertly, and her design work uh, that she leads ingeniously synthesizes culture, climate, civic place, and, and building design and technology. Um, not surprisingly, Allison's work has garnered a number of awards, uh, uh, not, not insignificantly FAIA, but also um, awards for projects such as the August Wilson Center in Pittsburgh, CREATE, which is the cam big campus in, research campus in Singapore, um, uh, which is a green mark uh, platinum research facility, the new Calexico U.S. Port of Entry, and the Princess Nora Abdulrahman University uh, uh, Health Sciences and Research Campus in, in, in Rida. Uh, as a studio design lead, Allison's projects uh, include uh, the San Francisco International Airport's uh, International Terminal, the San Francisco C Civic Center Complex, and the, and, uh, the Library of Virginia. Um, she's also led the development of numerous headquarter corporate facilities. Um, at AECOM, uh, she's currently designing two research labs um, for NASA. So Allison is a Loeb Fellow from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And um, as I mentioned, she, was, uh, she became a FAIA in 1997, and she was honored in 2014 as one of the Bay Area's uh, most influential women by the Bay Area Business Times. So Allison, congratulations. <laughs> Well, this is really a wonderful honor. I have to, I have to, I have to say, you know, it's one of those things that happens when you're not thinking about it, you know. And when you look in the mirror and you realize you have all this gray hair and you've practiced in the Bay Area for almost 40 years, um, it feels good to be recognized this way, yeah. and it really does. So. You know, education in my family is really important. I have my mom here. <laughs> and, and I say I have my little sister here, and I always go like this, but she's got gray hair, too. And, <laughs> and uh, two other sisters who aren't here, and, and my husband, Walter. Um, so as, as Kofi said, family is really important because it's part of what takes you where you want to go, and they're there kind of helping float you along even when you're not aware that they're doing it. So thanks to my family and my father, who's not here, but he floated us all. When I look around the room, it's very hard not to see at every single table multiple people with whom I've worked. And I think that that is um, an important connection to the Berkeley education that I got because it really wasn't just about learning how to design things. It was about learning how to ask the questions and, and do the things that are not just about um, design, but are much broadly, more broadly based than that. You know, it includes environmental, even when people weren't talking about lead and all that stuff. It includes everything that has to do with social factors, planning, urban design, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's like the world has come around again, and after 17 years at at uh, SOM and 15 at Perkins and Well, being at AECOM is a platform which totally mirrors the importance of thinking broadly, acting broadly, and being extraordinarily intelligent in the way that we carry on in our profession. I can't think of what I would have done otherwise uh, as a professional. 
Um, I am honored to be recognized by the College of Environmental Design. Yesterday I saw Dean Bender and Dick Peters, and I know that there are many people who go way back to the time when I decided to go to Berkeley for my master's, when it was the number one graduate school. I had choices. It was the number one graduate school in the country. And so I, after spending a day at the soiree and the circus yesterday, I feel like we're there. We're there. And um, so I am so honored. And this is really kind of heavy in, ma in many ways. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. I now have the great pleasure of introducing Rick Holiday. Uh, Rick Holiday uh, is going to introduce our keynote speaker, Carol Galante, and his, also his great friend. And, uh, and I'm really delighted to be able to, uh, to introduce Rick. He received his undergraduate here at Cal in uh, urban policy and a master's in city planning. And he was very interested in affordable housing and community development. And as a new graduate, he went off and um, uh, went to work at Eden Housing. Um, and this is one of the Bay Area's early nonprofit housing developers. He was soon tapped by the legendary Don Turner, um, with whom he had studied at CED, to help him run the newly established Bridge Housing, um, which is now the largest nonprofit housing uh, development organization in California. In, in 1988, Rick started Holiday Development, building affordable housing, mixed use, and infill urban projects. While leading his firm, he stayed involved with Bridge and currently serves, uh, I think, serves as board chair. Now, in 2004, CED recognized Rick's achievements with a Distinguished Alumnus Award. But in the years since 2004, we designed a beautiful new Distinguished Alumni Medal, which he did not receive. So Rick, please come and get your medal. <laughs> So, I'm, I'm relying on you to introduce Karen. Okay, got it. So, here. All right, good. All right, all right, good. All right. Um, thank you. This is a nice piece of hardware. Um, this is uh, an amazingly wonderful night for me and actually my wife, Nancy, mainly because we love Berkeley. We love... We love Berkeley for all the things that everybody said here because we both got the privilege of going here when it was affordable. And so the comments earlier about how difficult it is resonate with us and we encourage people to support the program to make it more available to people of modest means. I'm here because I love Don Turner. Uh, without Don, I think I might have graduated with an MCP. I definitely wouldn't be carrying this thing. Uh, and I don't know quite what would have happened, to be blunt. Uh, I was sort of wandering aimlessly in my second year of graduate school, and I bumped into Don's class, and my life was changed. And that's a different conversation, but it's, it's, uh, it's an important part of my life. I'm here because I love Carol Galante. I've known Carol 40 years, and it's crazy. I've known my wife 47. I love my wife <laughs> deeply. I really respect Carol for putting up with me professionally for 40 years. Because I met her sort of in, I was this undergraduate, and I've, I'm just going to go back, just take you through for eight little segments before she speaks, because she's got a lot to say tonight, and we need to listen to what she has to say. But um, between 75 and 80, I was an undergraduate, sort of working my way into the professional world, and Carol and I were students and sort of young professionals, but we really didn't interact then. We kind of knew each other existed, and I, she probably didn't like me, or I don't know. I, I wasn't a very good, very, very active student. But in 1980, I had the good fortune. I was, I was getting Eden housing together, and I really needed some help. And son of a gun of Carol Gallant, they didn't show up from Santa Barbara. And what a, what a partner and friend and colleague she was. Eden was, was a wonderful place that we shared together for a few years. And... Um, then I went off and, 
and, and met Don and, and Carol and I still collaborated and there was a little bit of creative tension between Bridges' goals and Eden's goals. But, but Carol and I always kept a really deep and, and honored friendship and, and professional respect. Um, there was some tension because Bridge was appearing to crowd out some of the nonprofits like Eden, but Carol and I could always talk about it. And then in uh, you know around 85 or so, so now I've known Carol roughly 10 years, um, we, we were able to co-opt her and bring her into Bridge, Don and I. I said, Don, this is, this is probably the best person. You think I'm good, we, we need her, okay? Uh, so Don uh, agreed with me and, and we, we were able to co-opt Carol to come in. And between 85 and 90, uh, Don and Carol and I worked very closely together in a lot of ways that really formed the nucleus and essence of Bridge today. Then I decided I wanted to be a private developer and go do lofts and Carol was supportive of that. She was probably glad to get rid of me. So you go do that. Don was a little bit upset. So then from you know 90 to 95, I was out trying to develop lofts and I'd meet with Carol and Don and Don would say to me often, he said, man, you were right. <laughs> she's amazing. You, you were good, but she's amazing. Uh, <laughs> and um, they built a really strong nucleus and foundation for what the bridge is today. Then sadly, you know, we all know we lost Don in 96 to a plane crash. And uh, Don's wife, Deirdre, is here tonight. And for those of you who don't know Deirdre, she's just one of the most wonderful people in the room. Um, she inspired Don to levels Don didn't know existed. Don, as wonderful as he was, had three wives. Deirdre was the third, and he said, dude, the third time is the charm. <laughs> uh, so, I have one, and the first was really good. Uh, <laughs> Don really respected and loved Nancy dearly, and so it's, it was a really, 95 to 2000 was really painful, uh, because we'd lost Don. So Carol and, and I, formed a bond that was different around how, how do we protect Bridge and how do we build this incredible legacy? And how do we deal with the loss of somebody as powerful as Don? Because Don was a big force in Carol's life, which I'm sure she'll share with you. So then by 2000, um, you know, Carol, I, get, I look at it, we've known each other 25 years then, and you hadn't said, geez, I'm sick of you. Uh, we, started, we started looking at, at West Oakland as an opportunity area and I was doing some private development work and Bridge was getting more active doing a rebuild of Acorn and some Hope Six developments and we ended up working together um, in, in a really unusual way that led to sort of redevelopment of a lot of the mixed income housing in West Oakland um, that's down there today. Then by 05, Carol, uh, I was on the board by the way. I, you know, I went on the board when I left Bridge in 1990 so I actually kind of got to be her boss a little bit which was fun. Um, but it was never quite like that. But uh, in 2005, I was pretty active as a board member and Carol was a really, really powerful CEO of our company. She came in at one of our, our uh, retreats and this is relevant to sort of where she's gonna go tonight. She said, you know, I just want you guys to know, I'd like to do 50% of my time to policy. And we went, what? <laughs> she said, yeah, I think that, that the policy and the, and the way things are being handled for housing is just not right. And I got a lot to offer and we went, well, yeah, you got a company to run. You know, Bridge was a big company. We said, net. <laughs> so I think we negotiated that we, you know, she said she wanted 50% time. We said, you can have 20% time. She really took 40% time and worked 120%. Sorry, Jim, uh, that fell on you. But uh, she was really active in creating the, the whole notion of infill and Proposition 1C with Senator Parada, who's here tonight who, uh, by the way, was way ahead of the curve on, on all that stuff. And uh, Claudia Capio is here tonight, who's running the Housing and Community Development Programs for Governor Brown, uh, is actually a close colleague and friend of Carol's, and uh, um, was involved in, uh, probably peripherally in helping shape that. And Claudia's very, very involved in helping shape the next level of where the state will invest in smart growth, which I think Carol may address as well. So that, that was 05 to 10. Carol sort of dabbled in policy and ran bridge, and I was on the board. And then, in, you know, it was really more like 2008-9, so I'm rounding up. You know, President Obama wins, and 
Who does he want? He wants gold standard. So uh, Sean Donovan, who's the Secretary of HUD, gives me the, the, the pleasant surprise now that I'm board chairman of Bridge because I've moved up the ranks. So I'm all excited. I'm board chair. Carol, it's going to be great. It's going to be easy. Carol goes, Rick, I'm going to Washington. I said, what? She said, yeah, I have to do this. And she said, I'm going to 100% policy, not 50 or 20. You can figure Bridge out, but I'll help you. So, so in any event, that 20, 2010 to 2015, for those of you who didn't really watch the housing crisis, I think, uh, you know, think about this. You know, she comes into this position where FHA was doing maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15% of the market. Nobody really paid any attention to it. She had a staff that was pretty, pretty, pretty lame, to be blunt. She wakes up, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac blow up, and the only loans that can be made are really FHA loans. And, and Congress and everybody in the country is going, hey, the way to fix the economy is get more housing. So she's being told, yeah, yeah, great. Make a huge amount of loans with an inept staff. Don't lose a dollar. And get confirmed by a, a Senate that says bifurcated is what we got. All right? She did it. She did it. And uh, I watched her with awe. Quite honestly, I had nothing to do with this stage of her life. I just sort of heard about it when she would come back at, uh, to visit uh, family. And I would say one of the unsung heroes tonight is Jim, her husband, because he's, uh, yeah, I give him a hand. Uh, uh, Jim, has, Jim has seen Carol's talent and has, has his own career, which is, which is uh, very significant in the legal profession, but he's supported her efforts and been willing to adapt to what her needs are. And I think Carol is, is eternally grateful, at least I know for that. And, and we in the housing community are eternally grateful, Jim, for the time you've, you've allowed Carol to give us. So here it is, 2015, and, and Don is gone, and there's a chair here that hadn't been meeting its expectations for many of us who love Don. And here we go. Uh, we have the harmonic convergence. Carol Galante is a little bit burnt out. Great. Uh, Jennifer Walsh, who's got a dynamic presence that I think all of you know about better than me. And we go, this is it. Let's go. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and have been part of getting Carol back to Cal so she can talk to us tonight. Carol Galante. Well, that's nice out there. Thank you all for being here, uh, for supporting CED. It's, uh, it really is a, a great and special night. I, I do want to just congratulate the other distinguished alumni that are, are here. Uh, this really is a very special place for, for all of us. And I am moved, uh, after listening to uh, Sana, the, our student speaker, to add my a voice of the importance of uh, UC as a public and affordable uh, institution. Uh, it's the primary reason I came here over 30 years ago. Uh, yes, it was one of the top planning schools, uh, but uh, it was in no small part because uh, Berkeley gave me in-state tuition from uh, the time that I arrived. Uh, they made it affordable to a kid like me who was from a working class family, uh, a father who didn't uh, graduate from high school, who worked multiple jobs to support his uh, family. And yes, I still work 20 to 30 hours a week uh, while I was here at Berkeley. I had no uh, actual skills at that time. And so uh, I was a, uh, a, where's Michael Johnson and, and John Stewart? They know we used to joke about our uh, athletic prowess, although, uh, you know, John played for Stanford football and Michael ran track and there was no Title IX, but I was a competitive swimmer. So, uh, you, you know, I did have a, a little bit of uh, athletic support, but no, no financial support for those kinds of activities. So what did I do? I, I worked uh, for the city of Richmond uh, lifeguarding and teaching the Richmond Sharks, coaching the Richmond Sharks uh, swim team. And I would take the 72 bus up San Pablo Avenue uh, every day after school and, and coach the Richmond Sharks. So, you know, even if you don't have employable skills when you start, hopefully by the end you do. But, uh, it, you know, in today's environment, uh, you know, it really is critical to garner the kind of support that students need to uh, uh, take classes here at this wonderful university. So I encourage you all to do that. 
Thank you, uh, Jennifer Dean Walsh. We learned in Washington you do use uh, professional titles, uh, but uh, I'm going to call you Jennifer anyway. Uh, so Jennifer, uh, Ken Rosen and Nancy Wallace, uh, Dwight Jaffe from the um, Fisher Center on Real Estate, I think some of them are, are here. Karen Chapel from IURD for the kind of support that I am getting as I've arrived uh, here at Berkeley. All of you who contributed to the Turner Endowment, uh, I really want to, the original Turner Endowment, I, I really want to thank you for that. Uh, to Deirdre for always uh, being accessible to me and just we have a, obviously a, a great, great bond. Uh, and uh, of course to Rick Holiday, who in spite of that embarrassing introduction, uh, uh, remains one of my closest advisors and, and mentors, uh, even though we actually are only a few years apart in, in age. Uh, he's kind of like the big brother I never had, and he always has called me kiddo. That is his uh, terminology for me. Kiddo, we're going to get this done, kiddo. Uh, and, and the reason I didn't know him very well, uh, to be just a little payback on the embarrassment, the reason I didn't know him very well when we were both going to CED is because he spent all his time at Cal basketball games. <laughs> and that's the truth. But Rick, thank you for everything and, and for always uh, being there for me. And, and thanks to all of you, really, for bringing bringing me back home where I think I belong. And that's not just to my beloved Jim. It's not just to my house and to California, but uh, really bringing me back home here to, uh, to Berkeley, where I met and was inspired by Don Turner when he taught in the architecture department. Uh, he wasn't the only great teacher and mentor here. Uh, there were many others, Roger Montgomery, Dean Richard Bender, Alan Jacobs, Mike Teets, who's here tonight, and, and I could go on, uh, but it was a wonderful uh, experience for me. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, later about why I'm here at Berkeley, but just to say this at the core of it is that I really hope uh, to give just something back for all the years that I have taken uh, from this uh, great great place. Uh, and if I had any doubts that I would uh, learn as much as I contribute during this period of time, I certainly have no doubts after uh, being part of yesterday's circus and seeing the wonderful student presentations. I know I'm going to learn as much from the students and the faculty here um, as I uh, hopefully uh, contribute uh, back. Now I do, um, I promised actually uh, John Stewart uh, that is the John Stewart who is here this evening from the John Stewart Company, not the John Stewart of The Daily Show. Uh, that before I talk more about uh, my intentions here at Berkeley or other things, that I would give you a few personal insights uh, into what it's like to be in the halls of uh, power in Washington, D.C. Not that the halls of the HUD building feel very much like halls of power. Uh, as I thought about making uh, these remarks and what secrets I could reveal and not reveal, uh, I happened to be having breakfast with a colleague, Bill Fallick, who uh, sponsored a table but could not be here tonight. And at some point in the conversation, he mentioned a similar event that he had been to and that the after dinner talk was given by someone that many of us in this room know, and that when that person came up on stage to give their after dinner talk, he did so holding a guitar proceeded to play two fabulous songs, and then without saying a word, turned and sat down. <clears throat> now, I am not going to do a Dean Lyons on you, uh, because guess what, I, uh, in spite of wanting to be a rock star uh, and a journalist as alternate careers, I don't have the talent for either, but it did get me, get me to thinking about what song would sum up my experience in Washington, D.C. if I were to perform it? And hands down, in a flash, it came to me. That would be the Grateful Dead's truckin'. <laughs> and the famous refrain, what a long, strange trip it's been. Long, uh, because working in Washington for almost six years is definitely dog years. For many reasons, it feels like I've had a whole entire separate career from what I did here in California uh, going to Washington, crammed into just those few years. And maybe it felt long because I worked 24-7 uh, on my uh, BlackBerry, was tied to my government-issued BlackBerry. By the way, they really will go bankrupt when the, uh, the government uh, stops using BlackBerry. <clears throat> 
Uh, maybe it felt long because it was going back to my childhood and actually experiencing this odd phenomenon called seasons. Uh, maybe it was the opportunity to travel across the country uh, to so many different cities and towns and soak up and learn challenges and opportunities and the creative thinking brought to bear uh, through, through uh, all, all these different um, organizations and communities. And I know that we here in the Bay Area and California think really we are the only innovators, but I have to tell you necessity is the mother of invention and Cleveland is doing some phenomenal work. Detroit is doing some phenomenal work. Uh, and yes, we're innovative, but it was really a great experience to get out there and uh, see what is happening in planning, in housing across the, across the country. Uh, but maybe it also um, really felt longer than it was because of the bonds and relationships uh, that were forged with colleagues inside and outside of government. It truly was a band of brothers experience being in the midst of this financial crisis caused by the housing market collapse and being thrown in with a group of people that you didn't know and expecting to uh, come out with uh, solutions to these uh, very uh, difficult problems. Uh, but it was also building great uh, me memories, uh, building and mentoring a team of talented young people and learning so much from the dedicated public servants who were there full time before we got there. People used to joke, you know, there's the A team and the B team and the career employees are the B team. Be here when you got here, be here when you leave. Uh, <clears throat> but they were, you know, by and large, a a uh, terrific group of people to learn from and, and to work with. Um, I want to tell you one story about <clears throat> uh, some of the relationships and bonding that goes on. And I partly want to use this particular story because it involves uh, a guy named Dr. Michael Stegman, who was a contemporary and a good friend of Don Turner's. Uh, and actually the granddaddy of housing policy in the academic world and in government, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he was a senior advisor to Treasury Secretary Geithner uh, in, in government, and still is uh, right now, to Secretary Liu. And we were in one of these interminable uh, meetings that had no decisions at the end of it. Uh, it was a meeting of what we call the housing deputies. Now, the housing deputies, which, by the way, without someone of the caliber of a Sean Donovan at HUD as secretary, HUD, even though, you know, housing is in HUD's title, HUD would not have even been at the table uh, in other administrations with, uh, you, you know, HUD just is a second class citizen in the federal government uh, cabinet. But because we had such uh, great folks uh, leading HUD, we were at the table uh, with this housing deputies meeting, which is HUD, Treasury, National Economic Council, Domestic Policy Council, and the Council of Economic Advisors. And we met weekly in this ornate room in rickety old antique furniture in what is theoretically the White House. So when you hear people talking about going to White, all these people get meetings at the White House, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're not really in the White House. They are in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, which by the way is pretty nice and ornate, but it is not the West Wing, so don't, don't, don't let people fool you. Uh, anyway, we'd meet in this room literally every Wednesday, uh, 4 o'clock, and we have these meetings of how we're solving the housing crisis and what adjustments we're making in the policies and programs we have out there. So on this particular day, we have a newly appointed uh, deputy in the Council of Economic Advisors, a renowned economist, but he just shows up, okay? And uh, we're, we're, we're kind of under a deadline here. The president wants to make a speech. We don't call him the pre president. POTUS, you all watch West Wing, right? President of the United States. Uh, POTUS wants to make a speech on housing on a certain anniversary date. So we're really under the gun to make these policy decisions. And this guy comes in, and you could almost see the tweed jacket and, if, and the pipe. Uh, you know, he just was like an academic uh, caricature, but a, a really renowned guy. So he says, uh, why are we looking at government intervention in rental housing? He said, uh, what's the theory of the case? 
He said, I get single family, you know, it's systemic risk, it's a big contributor to GDP, but I don't, I don't get why we would have government intervention in rental housing. Now, uh, I am an inpatient type, not much of an academic, uh, it, it, although I've learned to appreciate it. And I'm sitting there steaming, thinking, we've been at this for three effing years already, uh, and we need to make some decisions and get going. Stegman, in his professorial way, shoots me a glance across the table. He knows me well. He knows I can be counted on to call the question and to move things forward quickly. But he also knows that if the Council of Economic Advisors isn't with us on this policy, his boss is not going to sign off on it, and it's not going to go anywhere. So in this glance, uh, we have communicated to each other in an instant. And that communication was the equivalent of him putting his arm around me. Because we're across the room, so he didn't do this. But metaphorically, putting his arm around me and saying, down, girl. I got this one. <laughs> he profused, you know, uh, proceeds to diffuse the situation by you know, promising to sit with the guy offline and take several additional meetings with them. And uh, I will say it took a while, but after a month or so, uh, this new economist was, was totally there. And as Don would awful, often say, there's no zealot like the convert it. This guy was there. He was an advocate for the uh, things that I wanted to do on rental housing, and, and we moved forward. And, and both Stegman and I uh, uh, remain fast comrades in arms, but I also now have a new comrade in arms uh, for housing finance re reform. So long, yes, it was a long trip. Strange, indeed. Uh, I brought a number of mantras or expressions with me to HUD. Uh, many of them are ones that were guiding principles I learned from Don and from Rick and carried on uh, from my work at Bridge. And uh, on my going away party from leaving HUD, uh, the staff did a big poster for me. And on that poster, uh, they included many of these isms. Uh, which was great because it meant to me that I knew that they had gotten the cultural into their cultural DNA some of the expressions and mottos that I I wanted to uh, lead by and I wanted them to to live by and one of them of course was whatever it takes and one of them was if it were easy someone else would have done it by now and one of my own favorites uh, failure is not an option so all three of those were on my going away poster from from HUD. Um, but that's not what was strange. What was not on the poster were two expressions that evolved, which I think of as just totally a Washington experience and what a strange uh, land it is there. The first expression, which we started to repeat um, almost daily uh, at a number of points, is uh, an expression that is, you just can't make this shit up. <laughs> Shortened sometimes with a shrug to poop. <laughs> uh, now, I'm going to give you just one example. Um, you all may have read about the Benghazi talking points, or the TPs, as we say in Washington, and how they went back and forth between the White House and the State Department and the UN uh, on who, who was involved in you know, creating these talking points for um, person going on CNN, and I have to tell you, I, I had a laugh out loud when I read this whole controversy because, uh, frankly, I was shocked that all this existed on email. And of course, now we're learning that the Secretary of State didn't actually have government email and, and can't be foia but that's a whole other story. Um, wh why I was shocked is when I had this situation of the FHA fund uh, going negative, as we call it, and needing a bailout, though to be clear, it was not a bailout. The government bails out private companies, and since FHA is a full government guaranteed program with an explicit guarantee, uh, and there were plenty of reserves, this was not a bailout, and I banned the word bailout in my offices. Uh, but I digress. We knew it was going to be controversial. 
So we established controls around who would have the information, why and how. We literally did not use email. We walked PowerPoint decks and press releases and numbers to the White House, to the Treasury Department. We numbered the decks. We took them back at the end of briefings. And inside HUD, I was the only person allowed to talk to the Secretary in person about what, how the numbers were evolving. We knew they weren't going to be good, but we were going to control this story. We held meetings in my office with the small team working on it under a code name on the calendar. <clears throat> Seriously, this is not you know, like FBI. This, we, we were doing this. Uh, and, and we were feeling pretty good. We were feeling pretty good about ourselves, our process, our message. We had gotten the word out to our allies in broad strokes, no numbers. But we signaled uh, that they you know, needed to be prepared to do press quotes on background and say the right things. And uh, you know, we had all this planned. Uh, we had a detailed rollout plan, another good Washington expression. Uh, uh, we had a press briefing planned, embargoed until Congress got the actual information. So reporters were going to come in, they were going to get the information, they were going to hold their stories till we told Congress. I mean, we, we, had, this, we had this down. Game on. We're, we're, we're ready to go. So at about 8.30 the night before the release, I'm sitting at my desk reviewing the final deck for the press conference, double checking the rollout, and I get a call on my cell, from, cell phone from a Wall Street Journal reporter. And this is a guy who I think is the most straightforward, honest, thorough reporter on housing issues I have ever met. He understands it, no matter how complex it is, he makes sure he has the information. And uh, he says, uh, I uh, just want you to know I have uh, the number uh, and he quotes it to me, and he said, do you want to go on record with a comment? Now, it was really good this was a telephone conversation because my face would have given him all the confirmation that he needed <laughs> that he had the number. Uh, but I start in on, I can't think he can't, you know, I can't let him know that he has the number, that he really has the number. So I, I start being a little coy. Oh, Nick, come on, you know, uh, we're not giving you an exclusive, it's too late. Uh, you'll, you'll have the number in 12 hours, blah, blah. And he says, Commissioner, you don't understand what I'm saying. I have the number, and I got it off of the HUD website. <laughs> the report's been posted. Now, I'm not going to take an hour to tell you what went down in the next period of time, but suffice it to say, uh, the report got pulled down from the website. He got an exclusive that evening uh, <clears throat> so that we could make sure we got our spin into that exclusive. And the next morning when the Republican chairman of the House Financial Service Committee finds out that, yet again, the press got the information before he did and he was livid, uh, he wanted an explanation and he wanted an investigated and he wanted whoever made this mistake fired. And of course, you know, he wasn't so happy with my leadership and called that into question publicly. All I had to say was the best laid plans were blown and you just can't make this shit up. <laughs> Which brings me to the second expression in this strange land coined by one of my predecessors from the Clinton administration. Just remember, never assume conspiracy when mere incompetence will do. <laughs> we never did figure out who uh, posted the report prematurely and why and why they posted it. Did they do it on purpose? Was it an accident? Uh, and that's because it went into this vortex between the FHA team and the public affairs team in this huge bureaucracy, something that I know nobody at Berkeley has any experience about. <laughs> anyway, strange indeed. And trip? Uh, it was an absolute trip, like a psychedelic trip. The highs were higher. The lows were lower. The morning of my confirmation hearing, I was driving to the office, and I listened to pop radio to relax. I'm, I'm into, you know, kind of those female pop singers. And, and on the radio, uh, there, there was a song that came on, uh, and I actually, I meant to look up who, who did it. I can't remember who sings it. But uh, she says, I will go down with the ship. 
This is a line on a song that's happening as I'm driving to my confirmation hearing. And I chuckled to myself because I knew FHA was gonna be tough sailing. I suspected that the reason my predecessor had moved on was because he too knew that it was uh, going to be tough and he didn't want it to happen on his watch. But I had a different attitude. I was gonna work my ass off to turn this ship around and I was gonna do it willingly and embrace the journey. And it was quite an experience and I did it and I learned so much uh, that can be applied moving forward. And if I had the opportunity, I would do it all over again. So, which brings me back to why I've chosen, though, to come home uh, from this long, strange trip. Uh, there were many people, and Rick touched on this, uh, in this room who didn't really understand why I would leave Bridge to begin with. I was running arguably the best damn organization, doing what I was passionate about, building and sustaining homes for people who need them. Uh, I was working with a talented, committed team, a number of whom are here this evening, and building on a legacy of a great vision from Don Turner and Rick Holliday. It, it didn't get any better than that. Yet while I was at Bridge, I did have this remarkable opportunity to work on government policy in a number of areas, including Prop 1C with Senator Parada and creating billions of dollars for transit housing and affordable housing. And I just had this vision of coming full circle from my early days in local government down in Santa Barbara and wanting to make good policy that's actually informed by the experience I had had uh, in the trenches. And I also heard Don's voice in my head at that time, something that he said in one of his classes. And it's one of these things where, uh, you know, it's amazing that all those years later you could remember one thing that a professor said that wasn't on the actual substance of the topic, but was it about how you deal with your career and, and life. And he said, you know, it's really important to go in and out of the various sectors. Try nonprofit, try public, uh, you know, be in the private sector. You're going to learn different experiences and different knowledge from each of those experiences. And so I really wanted to take an opportunity to do policy development and uh, learn more. And when, when this opportunity to go work for Obama came along, uh, I, I just felt I had to, uh, to grab for it and, and do it. I will say I learned a number of things being there during this crisis period uh, that uh, really uh, I, wanna, I wanna bring to Berkeley and the experience here. Uh, that, that crisis meant reacting in an emergency response mode, you know, 24-7. Uh, it necessitated, uh, it, it made it very difficult to be thoughtful and deliberate and actually think long term about challenges and, and problems and what you would ideally want to do. The government at every level needs to rely heavily on external information coming into it from academics and from industry and from advocates and sorting through it to come up with the best uh, possible government uh, public policy. Really hard to do in uh, a crisis mode. The other thing I learned is that you get into this rarefied air of uh, the upper echelons of government and you really do go into a bubble. And it's designed to be that way, uh, making it difficult to communicate with stakeholders and industry representatives. Uh, and it makes it difficult to hear the best possible information on very important decisions. And so when I think about coming here to Berkeley, in addition to working with the students, uh, hopefully inspiring them and getting some inspiration back, and hopefully they're gonna come up with some grand ideas that none of us have thought of yet to solve the global housing issues in, in the world. Uh, but I, I think about the ability to be more deliberate and thoughtful, more evidence-based in terms of uh, really bringing the good thoughts of the academy to the work that is happening out there in policy development and, and in the world. And I think that we can do that, blend the best 
of academic, the best of our business partners, our, you know, people who are doing the work, who roll up their sleeves and get out there every day, whether it's in finance or development or planning and design, and, and really bring that all together around housing issues uh, and make a difference. And that's what I want to see happen uh, here at Berkeley. And I think uh, there is uh, no better place at this point in time uh, to do that. Um, we're at the center of C uh, San Francisco Bay Area with all of its innovation and all the resources of, and talent of the alumni and the people out there who want to be involved in these issues that can be brought together uh, as part of this center's effort and uh, really draw on the inspiration of all of them and of, of the folks that are here. So I just uh, couldn't think of anything that I would rather do next in life after leaving Washington than, than coming here and creating that with all of you. And I truly, truly look forward to a very uh, prosperous time. Last thing I want to say is this is not just about honoring Don in, in name. It is doing what he would want us to do, which is to take our passion and drive and work at inspiring others and doing better work and doing it at scale. And so with that, I'd like to conclude with, uh, I know probably coffee's on the table and you've all drink and drank your alcohol, but raise a glass to Don Turner. Thank you all very much. Carol, I can't tell you how thrilled and delighted I am to have you here with, at the College of Environmental Design and working with uh, the Haas School of Business and the Fisher Center, um, and I, I, I imagine other places soon on campus um, as, the, as the I, Donald Turner, Distinguished Professor of, of Affordable Housing and Urban Policy. Um, we're thrilled. Um, and we're really glad that you're back from the swamp, um, in, <laughs> as, you, as you put it, in Washington. Uh, I, I, I want to conclude by thanking everyone uh, so much for being here, um, for joining us uh, and coming together for this lovely evening.